I can't, right, I can't see anybody, so you just let me know if you want me to start reading or if I should okay. listen. Okay. If I, um, yeah, we're good to go? Yeah, you're good to go. Okay, right. Well, welcome. You want yeah. the volume up? Turn your volume up high. It's as high as it's going to go, I think. Yeah. Do you have a speaker maybe that can be easier for something? Okay, I can, I can hear. Can you uh, hear? Okay, you good. Hear? Okay. Right, so well, welcome to... I can totally hear. Uh, so welcome to the, the panel. Um, so DFW Society Ethics um, Representation. And Tom Winchester is an artist and art critic in St. Petersburg, Florida, and has presented at DFW Con in previous years and has published on the DFW Society blog. Over to you, Tom. Let's go ahead and uh, start reading my paper. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. And it interrupt me. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I can hear you, but I can't see you. Oh. You're kind of going in and out. So this is the cult of the endless kids, heteronormativity in an Can you hear me? Off and on, yeah, go ahead. Is this okay? Okay. For a novel set in 2009, Dave Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest seems to represent the real world of its time of its publication, the mid-1990s, much more so than it does the late 2000s. One example of this is its thematic heteronormativity and usage of discriminatory language toward LGBTQ plus communities. Infinite Jest is heteronormative in that it employs homosexuality as a means to differentiate characters and objects from others, and sometimes goes far as the novel explicitly creating a context where only, uh, well, okay, some of the ways the novel conveys heteronormative themes are implicit. Examples of the novel explicitly creating a context where only an equal representation from both extremes of the gender binary continuum is considered normal, though, aren't hard to find. To begin with, it may be helpful to define the concept of heteronormativity. This introduction to the 1993 collection of essays titled Fear of a Queer Planet, Queer Politics, and Social Theory, editor Michael Warner wrote, quote, pet culture thinks of itself as of human association as the very model of intergender relations, as the indivisible basis of all community, and as the means of production without which society wouldn't exist." Unquote. The quotation is from a subchapter in Warner's introduction titled Heteronormativity and Social Theory, and it served as this paper's definition of the concept of heteronormativity. We still connected? Everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, cool. If there's one example of an explicated situation where heterosexuality is described as socially normal that may stand as represented for the novel as a whole, it's the cult of the endless kiss. Included in Endnote 304, the cult of the endless kiss is a contest consisting of pairs of Canadian adolescents pressing their mouths together as if kissing, sharing breaths, and trying not to pass out so they can win a car or a truck or something. The scene is heteronormative in that the pairs are totally heterosexual, stated as, quote, of whom one half were female, unquote, and continues uh, with to say that the contest is usually played as such, usually played as such, except, quote, in very esoteric variations of the game, unquote. So what's being created in the narrative is not only a situation where heterosexuality is being championed, but also one where homosexuality is being treated as abnormal. I'm going to put you in the shade so my thing doesn't back out again. Um, the fact that a non-male female pairing of the cult of the endless kiss is described as very esoteric variation game leaves no room for interpretation about whether the situation in the scene is intended to be understood as heteronormative. Scene serves as a blatant example of heteronormativity and infinite jest and should be considered as an outlier in the novel because it's explicitly so, whereas the majority of the novel leaves its heteronormative tendencies implicit. More broadly, the most obvious implication of heteronormativity in the novel is that there are no non-heterosexual characters among its main narratives. None of the main characters at Enfield Tennis Academy or Rennet House are openly among LGBTQ plus communities, and Orin and Condensa is only suspected of being gay. There are openly gay, char gay characters in Infinite Jest, and, uh, and characters who the reader is intended to understand as not being heterosexual, 
But these characters are all pushed to the margins of the narrative and of the narrative in roles as roles in himself's films or as destitute good for nothing. Quintessential marginalized LGBTQ plus character is poor Tony. He's homeless, lives in dumpsters, is wearing a cocktail dress with a feather boa, has a seizure in a public bathroom, after which, while he's being taken to the hospital, flirts with a male paramedic in the ambulance. Poor Tony's intrigue lies with how outlandish his characteristics can stretch away from social norms in the narrative, and his appearance as a man in woman's clothing is used to accentuate how socially outlandish his non-heterosexual orientation should be understood, as is evident by his being referred to at one point as, quote, his, her, its, unquote. At most, he's integral to the narrative because he plays a role in the assassination attempt, assassination attempt, which is why he's dressed as he is, but really he serves a little more purpose than providing context for who's at the margins of society in America. Poor Tony shows that even a novel full of drug addicts and criminals still has LGBTQ plus characters representing the most de destitute communities. Poor Tony is contextually portrayed as gay, but other LGBTQ plus characters in the novel are labeled as being homosexual, lesbian, gay, or any derogatory slur for these terms. Labeling is the most prevalent way Infinite Jest uh, conveys heteronormativity. In essence, these characters and some objects are differentiated from their context by being described as thematically related to homosexuality. Some of these label labelings are also meant to convey danger, and a few of them are at worst for the purpose of employing homophobia in the reader. The most, uh, the approach of differentiating by label is clear when considering the novel's use of identifiers that are so strung along and baroque that they exhibit Wallace's signature lexical prowess. Some choice Wallacean non-heterosexual identifiers include, quote, lesbian pharmaceutical cocaine addicts, um, quote, explicit homosexual sex scene, and, quote, radically butch lesbians. Yeah, Wallace takes argu arguably the most creative license with what in the narrative is capable of being described as gay, including non-human things. And most of, the, most of the time, these labels are clearly meant as derogatory. You guys can all still hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. The main character in Blood Sister, for example, is described as having a, quote, lesbianic haircut. Don Gately is visited by two wraiths, himself and Lyle, one of whom he describes as wearing, quote, kind of faggy bikini shorts, unquote. The main character of Accomplice is said to be in his boudoir with a young boy who's hunched on the bed in a, quote, homosexual way. The nuts who chase down Ray Lenz drive a car whose antenna has a, quote, gay leg hanging from it. The, no the nuts are wearing, quote, fagging necklaces. These are just a few examples of derogatory non-heterosexual descriptions that would be incoherent if removed from their heteronormative context. They also rely on the reader to be internally homophobic in order to be coherent, as if the reader somehow knows the stylistic characteristics of a lesbianic haircut without identifying details being provided in the text. The point of these descriptors isn't to convey that these objects are homosexual, but rather that they're different from the narrative than what the narrative considers to be socially moral. They're also meant to color such characters and objects in derogatory ways, which is fueled by ostensible, ostensible homophobia in the reader. Of course, these aren't the text's most egregious lexical offenders. Several descriptors in Infinite Jest use Slurs to convey Ray Lenz, who's possibly the most degenerate character of all, offers some of the most offensive anti-LGBTQ anti plus language in the novel. He seems to be an expert on determining who at Eden House is a, quote, closet poofta, unquote, suspects Jeffrey Day of being one, and goes as far to offer uh, the warning that, quote, the male model and acting profession is pretty much crawling with your closet poofdas, unquote. Another egregious example is with Gately. While on a drug binge, he notices, quote, the girls in coats and slatternly hose were fags dressed up as girls, like as in transvestals, unquote. Such flippant use of discriminatory uh, anti-LGBTQ plus slurs is clearly a style from Wallace's bygone era, because these terms are so out of bounds when it comes to today's standards of political correctness that it's difficult to imagine such usages to survive the editing process if it just were written to Y'all still with me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. With regard to Mimesis, Wallace actually properly represented his world during the time he was writing the Chess. 
Considering the environment of the early and mid-1990s in the United States, which saw barely any accountability toward anti-LGBTQ plus discrimination, such discriminatory descriptors are perfectly representative. It's easy to forget that the United States military official policy of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which forced service members to either remain in the closet or become closeted, was put into effect in 1993. It's also easy to forget that the passing of the Defense of Marriage Act, which prohibited same-sex marriage, became federal policy only months after Infinite Justice was published in 1996. The world Wallace knew was heteronormative, so in a way his writing successfully represents the time. One scene where Gately remembers his childhood includes the claim, quote, it was getting harder these days to tell the homosexuals from the people who beat up homosexuals. Such a claim perfectly paints not only the heteronormative context of the book, but also accurately, accurately represents the anti-LGBTQ plus climate of the 80s and 90s. The proliferation of homosexual panic, for example, in the late 80s was a legal defense for committing hate-driven violence toward people from the non-heterosexual communities is a telling example of such a climate. Eve Sedgwick wrote in the topic in a 1990 book, Epistemology of Closet, quote, Judicially, a homosexual panic defense for a, per for a person, typically a man, accused of anti-gay violence implies that his responsibility for the entire crime was diminished by a pathological psychological condition, perhaps brought on by the unwanted sexual advance from the man whom he had then attacked, unquote. In essence, the late 80s in the United States saw a wave of legal defenses where gay men could be legitimately murdered without consequence because the murderer felt panic brought on by an unwanted sexual advancement from that man. It's just one example of institutionalized discrimination that was going on uh, when Wallace was writing this. Going further, because of affi affiliations with deplorable characters, violence, and an association with HIV and AIDS, Infinite Jest treats what's not heterosexuality in specific discriminatory ways. LGBTQ plus communities were characterized during the time of its publication. Dangerous. One character in the novel, novel whom embodies such danger is the aforementioned in the panel before, Michael and Maddie Penulis's father. He repeatedly sodomizes the 10-year-old Maddie and is so deplorable that he not only rapes his son, but also resents the fact that sodomy is associated with homosexuality. The inclusion of an Irish-sounding slang for sodomy, quote, a fook and a boom, acknowledges the, acts with, acknowledges the act without calling it anything other than heterosexual. It's when Maddie shrinks away from his father's, quote, caresses that were somehow just over the line from the from true ethnic Irish fatherly affection, unquote, that his father becomes insecure about his sexuality. This is when he replies with such homophobia that he can't even speak its name, and this is going to be my best bad Irish, quote, then who are we, a son, to be scared of your own da? As if the da that broke his daily back were nothing more than a can't a dad show his son some love without being taken for a unquote. That was maybe that bastard. I don't know. The word dad penulus won't say is surely a slur for a gay man. To call dad penulus untrustworthy is a vast understatement. His pen pedophilic behavior uh, being tended to sodomy and homophobia seems needlessly to employ discriminatory language toward LGBT people's community for the purpose of character building. Yet, or but himself's film accomplice is possibly the novel's most overt discriminatory portrayal and most egregious exploitation of the non-heterosexual communities. It paints non-heterosexuals as both different and dangerous. The film, which involves a predatory older man unintentionally contracting HIV from a young male prostitute, sadistically slitting open his own penis with a razor, treats non-heterosexuals as Different fact by repeatedly reiterating the bull who are homosexuals. And as dangerous in that its thematic premise is founded on the 80s and 90s era assumption that gay men were more likely to have it. Both characters are rendered untrustworthy by the film, which closes because the older man has rendered him an it carrying accomplice to murder with the young male prostitute shrieking murder of murder. In true postmodernist fashion, the text then immediately offers an aesthetic self-interpretation with how claiming the film's, quote, essential project remains abstract and self-reflexive. We end up feeling and thinking not about the characters, but about the cartridge itself, unquote. Perhaps the film's aesthetics were Wallace's primary intention, and like many other passages of the book, Accomplice simply serves as an allegory for novel. But such an understanding has become clouded by today's standards of political correctness surrounding homophobic rhetoric. It would take a solidly homer, heteronormative context in order to understand accomplice as anything other than discriminatory scapegoating the LGBTQ plus community for the purpose of aesthetics. Of course, a heteronormative context 
specifically when it comes to homophobia surrounding AIDS, AIDS is exactly what Wallace had. 1990, Eve Sedgwick wrote, wrote, quote, AIDS discourse at every level until very recently focused on male homosexuality, unquote. And he said, and she said, one of the causes of it was the influence of the private sector. She called it, quote, an organized open season on gay men, unquote. Sedgwick claims that this was essentially a media-driven campaign scapegoating both AIDS culture and gay men. Quote, the acknowledgement slash management of this fact was the preoccupation of a strikingly sudden media-wide discursive shift in the winter and spring of 1987, unquote. Thematically, it seems somehow appropriately, appropriately Wallacean if the creative inspiration for his most discriminatory passages are rooted in homophobia disseminated by the media, even if it's not gay, that was a good one. Regardless, it's clear that Wallace was influenced by anti-LGBTQ plus climate of his time, especially considering the novel's strong reliance on the reader assuming connection, the connection between AIDS and the gay community. These real world events surely made the novel readable at the time of its publication for a heteronormative audience, but today's anti-homophobic audience can ever increasingly see Wallace's most homophobic passages as relics of what is, thankfully, a bygone. What it seems Wallace didn't anticipate is that the shifts in socio-political standards, specifically in this country of its origin and the subject of infinite chess, have rendered some of his texts overtly discriminatory. The result is a narrative that takes far too much creative license by 2019 standards and its lack of political correctness toward the LGBTQ plus community. Thank you. Just, I mean, just as a point, is it, um, Tommy, are you okay, kind of, if, if we have Jen's... Can you um, hear me from back here, or should I move the, the computer? I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, we okay? So, um, so now we have um, Jen Bettendorf. Um, Jen is a PhD student in English at the um, Graduate Centre at CNU, CUNY. Sorry. Um, her interests include visual and spatial poetics. Contemporary American fiction, mostly only the freaky kinds. Um, and we are told to think Mark Danielewski uh, more than George Saunders there. And so-called critical university studies and the writer. Jen. Well, thank you. I know you have a choice of panels to come to today, so thank you for choosing this one. Um, my abstract is, I don't want to say misleading, but I'm, I'm not speaking much about ethics, although I think there might be a sort of Levinasian reference I can snip, slip in there. Do you mind if I turn this down, Tom? Sounds good. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I was on a call this morning, and I was really bored, so I um, started doing some reading for my orals examinations, and I'm currently reading right now Giles Goat Boy by John Barth, and um, very early on there's a great line that I think um, nicely sort of encapsulates the question that I'm interested uh, to answer, not necessarily in this talk, but just of late when I think about Wallace. Um, so I googled the phrase, the phrase by the way is uh, protoscopy re repeats uh, hagiography, um, and I think that that's a really interesting idea. So uh, the, the sort of <laughs> the anal plumbing, right? Uh, in many senses is a way to sort of venerate the individual or, or entity being plumbed. Um, so I thought that was a weird phrase, didn't quite know what it meant, so I googled it and I came across um, some medical articles actually that were very contemporaneous with, uh, with Giles Goat Boy, so I'm going to read one of them and I want when, when, when I read it for you to think about um, what I'm describing, not literally but figuratively, what could it be a metaphor for? Um, and I'm thinking about the university and all of that kind of thing. Okay, so I'm going to read it and then we'll continue. This is a bit of an ad lib. I've never done this before, gone off script like this. Okay, the complex and intricate mechanisms involved in maintenance of continence and defecation are poorly understood, grossly undervalued, and generally taken for granted until impairment uh, occurs. In a civilized society, controlled defecation is vital to social well being. The first form of self-control which human beings learn entails the ability to inhibit voluntary defecatory responses until circumstances are socially convenient. The internal and external anal sphincters play an important role in maintaining continence over prolonged periods of time. 
Uh, the appropriate performance of these functions requires exquisite coordination of a complicated series of interrelated events. And then this is from a second article. I'm almost done, I promise. The anal sphincters, internal and external, have been the subjects of extensive study, yet much appears to remain unsettled. Both clinical and non-clinical studies have often yielded contradictory results. Anatomic studies of the external sphincter date from 1715, yet it has defied consistent and consensual description. Some form of its traditional description is found in all modern medical anatomic texts. However, when dissecting it, the student is invariably disappointed in his or her efforts to discern the subdivisions of the anal canal. The roles of other important non-sphincteric mechanisms are often overlooked. Um, so, <laughs> I, making the connection between that and what I'm about to talk about is going to be kind of difficult, but I think it could work. Um, my talk <laughs> is this titled, obviously, The Wallace Phase, um, and this is invoking not just uh, Marshall Boswell's book that he just came out with, um, The Wallace Effect, but also a conversation that I had um, when I was, like, two years ago when I was a first-year graduate student with the comp, comp lit bro, you have the Wallace bro, you also have the comp lit bro, um, who asked me, uh, what I'm into, I took that to mean what I'm into academically, um, and I mentioned Wallace, and he said, oh, I had a Wallace phase, but I grew out of it. Um, and that, the idea of the Wallace <laughs> phase has really stuck with me, because it's a sentiment that I, I don't know if anyone else has in, in, uh, encountered it in the, in the wild, so to speak, but it's a sentiment that I, that I come across very frequently. People have the Wallace phase, and then they, they um, purport to have moved on. Um, and I think I think the moving on is something that, that I, I feel as someone who's like just you know getting deep into the, the scholarly literature over the past two or three years, um, the idea that postmodernism feels like it's never going to die, and the post postmodernism is like you know always deferred, its arrival is always sort of forthcoming. I I, I find myself getting sort of anxious about that, um, and so this is. I guess kind of where the project comes out of it. And my thesis essentially is that um, the Wallace phase is like the final, I, I, this is my own sort of personal uh, gripe, but I, if we figure the Wallace phase is the final section of modernism um, and, and of postmodernism in particular. I don't know if anyone's read um, Boswell's book, but most of my talk is going to be speaking about um, his thesis there. And that's essentially, he has two parts in his book. The first two or three chapters are about um, John Barth uh, and, and how, um, and others, right, and how Wallace, in fact, was uh, maybe not quite as revolutionary as he purported to be. Um, and I think that that's a very complex genealogy, one that, uh, one, the resituating is a useful exercise to do to sort of bring other voices into the conversation with Wallace. But I think also, number two, um, it reminds us that like Wallace also sort of inflated his own ego a bit. I think you see this most clearly with his tennis. If you look back actually at the records, like he wasn't that good of a tennis player, right? But he reports to have been a really excellent one. I mean, we all do it, right? So none of us is, is uh, immune to that. Um, but then the second half of the book, he's speaking about um, novels that have followed uh, Wallace and specifically followed after his death. He speaks about Jeffrey Eugenides um, and the marriage plot and Jonathan Franzen are the two that I found most um, generative and interesting. And the thesis there is, is very similar to the previous thesis, which is that they're also responding in a sort of very Harold Bloomish sense to um, Wallace and trying to overcome him just as much as they're trying to engage with him um, and incorporate his thoughts into their work. So I wonder I guess it feels like modernism is never going to end because, like, if you really think a sort of a Harold Bloom version of modernism, then it's always a sort of continue, continual process that's, that is ongoing continuously um, of the overcoming of the, the father figure or whatever. Um, and I don't know if I, I don't know if I quite like that because I don't, I don't like adding like you know post 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 on the front of my, all of my words. I think it gets a little um, muddy, and I don't, I don't think we should be muddy with Wallace because he's very both precise and accurate, and I think he deserves a little more, if that makes sense. Um, so I get, I guess, a bit to the, like, the main section of uh, what I'm looking for feedback, uh, in short. I'll get to my main section now. Um, and it deals mostly, I guess, with the sort of context, uh, the informal context of uh, Wallace after his death. So obviously you have these formal engagements with Wallace. You have marriage plot and everything like that, and Wallace himself is fictionalized, but then you also have other 
texts that are imitating his voice and, and using the same, same kinds of reference moves or, and rhetorically speaking very similar. I'm going to turn you down again, sorry. Um, you obviously have all of these works that are very similar in, in, that, in that sense, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in looking at the sort of liminal part of that uh, and the things that maybe aren't quite as formal. So I have a few examples. The first is um, Dave Eggers, who obviously is a writer in his own right and that kind of thing. Um, I found online, maybe a year and a half ago now, um, two, I think his name is Edward Champion or Campion, I don't know if anyone is familiar with him, but he's, he's juxtaposed two um, introductions and, and reviews uh, that Eggers wrote uh, on Infinite Jest. So one when it first came out for the San Francisco Chronicle, and then one, uh, the foreword, I think, to that, the, the new version that came out, what, in 2010, I think it was? Um, and they're very much different, and I'm interested in that difference. I'm interested in considering whether or not Eggers is, is sort of playing into the Wallace Lipro, or you know, in retrospect after Wallace's death, um, is uh, trying to like hop on the train, you know, or or if he's actually reread the book and it's become um, it's fulfilled its own promises and prophecies and that kind of thing. So I'll read those right now, and then I'll move to another example, and then we can have a little discussion too. Um, so Dave Eggers flip-flops and downplays the extent to which Wallace has affected his work. In a now buried interview, of, excuse me, review of Infinite Jest, ten years prior to the publication of his glowing forward to the 20th anniversary edition of the novel, um, Edward Champion notes, I'm going to say Champion, I don't think that's how you say it, Eggers spoke less admiringly of Wallace's brilliant, fat, and frustrating second novel. Quote, extraordinarily indulgent, he writes, Infinite Jest loses itself in its superflu superfluous and wildly tangential flights of lexical diarrhea. That's a little bit of an <laughs> invocation of my original, and I'll return to it at the end. Um, and buckles under the weight of its own excess, a demonstration of what a gifted artist can produce without the hindrance of an editor. What a roast. Um, that was his first uh, like review of the novel, and then he returns to it. Um, compare that damning review to Eggers' later praise um, in the foreword to the 10th anniversary of the edition of, of the novel. Yeah, it was 10th, I don't know why I said 20th. Drum tight, he writes, and relentlessly smart, Infinite Jest is now for Eggers uh, somehow softened, it seems, um, by 10 years of what Boswell is calling this Wallace effect. So Wallace is going into cultural diffusion, not like sort of outside novel world, but also in novels as well. Um, <coughs> Softened by ten years of the Wallace effect, the masterpiece of a madman in full control of his tools, Eggers writes, his use of which are incredibly precise and focused. The result is a seismic work, an achievement that will outlast him, you and me. So this is obviously demonstrably different in tone, um, and the two works say a few things. The first, most obvious of which is like, you shouldn't trust a review, right? You have to read it yourself. Um, which is Boswell's, and I share this objection to, to Amy Hungerford. She has no standing to uh, say whether or not the book should be read because she hasn't read it yet. Although I'm very sympathetic to the scholar's demands on time and that kind of thing, especially uh, from a feminist perspective. So more than an inadvertent slip, Eggers' reversal might tell us more about the contours of Wallace's literary celebrity two years after his death than it does about Infinite Jest itself, or even Eggers for that matter. I might take that back. I think it actually says a lot about Eggers. Um, in 2008, the year of Wallace's death, Stephen Byrne dismissed the possibility of graphing the arc of Franzen's career in any useful or real way, because after three novels, it's rather early to determine whether or not cultural, excuse me, whether or not culture accepts him, that is Franzen, and his work as canonical. Regardless of canonicity, however, there remains the not unrelated question of literary prestige. Wallace only had two novels, plus Pale King, which is not, you know, quite out yet. Um, so I don't count that as a full uh, actual book. Um, by the same date, and tentatively, I'd submit that Wallace is uh, more frequently cited than Franzen, and I'm not talking necessarily in like, uh, I think it's called HNet, where you can like track all your citations and that kind of thing, and Google Scholar. I don't mean that, I mean the actual sort of cultural diffusion of the, the, these sort of casual references. Um, the two reviews that I've just read to you are pretty formal because they're in print, but I'm also interested in the ways in which we speak about Wallace in the hallway. I get that the reaction that I get all the time, right? Which is, oh, I had the Wallace phase. Um, I think that there's something in that tone and in that evocation that that is worth uh, lingering with. Um, so, I th how much more time do I have? Uh, quite a bit. I think. Yeah, yeah, you we yeah. good. Okay, I'll read a bit more, and then yeah. um, I'm interested to hear your feedback of how I guess best to look for this because again, this is sort of liminal and marginal. Um, <clears throat> 
just don't quite know where to go with it. Um, pointing out just that despite infinite just sometimes status as an American Ulysses, Boswell in uh, The Wallace Effect loosens up, deliberately or not, Wallace's uh, position as the leading status writer, this is him invoking Franzen's status um, contract distinction, uh, let's see, status writer of his generation, that's Wallace's, uh, Boswell's quote, complicating the assertion that Wallace was a big deal. Boswell starts his introduction by quoting Walter Kern, who after finishing Infinite Jest, asserted that next year's book awards have been decided. Decided they weren't, obviously, uh, because Infinite Jest, this is Boswell now, uh, was largely ignored by the literary establishment that would have uh, been the first agent in the novel's canonization. So while a status novel, then, is insufficient to be considered anything more than a very large doorstop, it's a little bit harsh. Compare this, for example, to the Corrections National Book Award um, and Friends and various other nominations, not just for that volume, but also for his other work as well. Um, Wallace doesn't feel at particularly home in either of the two categories, the, ca the contract novelist um, or, or among the status novelists uh, that Friends and outlines in Mr. Difficult, which is on uh, a different author, but still applies very much to Wallace, which I, I agree with Boswell, I think, in that regard. In each text, Boswell writes the fictionalized Wallace figure is toppled from his position on Mount Status and uh, brought back to earth, humbled and humiliated, uh, but also loved and celebrated. It's kind of Sisyphean. That might be a stretch. Um, Infinite Jeff's reputation as a status novel manages to survive, but for how long? Um, and in a different part of the essay, I, I think a bit about how um, Hungerford's thesis actually in, in making literature now is that publishers, this is her quotation now, are in the business of selling the social, they're not in the business of selling the, the print book or the text itself. They're, they're, they, they sell the sort of social interaction. I think that might be a stretch, but I think for Wallace, in fact, that's much more apt than she realizes. Um, and I think that also can capture a little bit of the sort of marginal uh, discourse that I'm, that I'm interested in thinking about. Um, how does Wallace's reputation be sort of modulated person to person on a very individual level. Um, so I don't know what we say to all of that, uh, but the, I don't know if anyone got this, the, the poop stuff at the beginning, I tried to make pretty relevant. I think it becomes a little bit more relevant later on. Um, I'm interested in the question, obviously at the heart of all of this, um, both with the uh, John Barth quotation with which I began and also with the poop stuff, but I guess more generally, um, with the question of canonization. Um, to what extent can we anticipate what's going to be canonized? Um, by canonized, I'm using that very loosely, of course. Um, but I'm also thinking about the fact that in the mid-90s, the early in the mid-90s, um, culture wars were raging, and the, the question of what's going to be on and off the syllabus um, is, is that's the sort of question ready to hand. Um, and that's, that's very much a decision on the margin that has to be made by individual instructors within one's classroom and that kind of thing too. So, the poop stuff is like, how does a text fall out of literary distribution? I don't know if anybody got that. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe I'll read, okay, let me like read it again so you guys don't think I'm actually crazy for, that's serious for thinking this. Okay, no, okay, I'm gonna read it again and think about it. This is the way the text gets forgotten, okay. The context and intricate mechanisms involved in the maintenance of continents and uh, continents in defecation are poorly understood. We don't know how, you know, we can't predict which text falls in and out. Grossly undervalued and generally taken for granted until impairment occurs. So like what happens when you're like, wow, I really like Wallace, let's not throw him out. You know, like that's an impairment. I don't know, I was really excited about this poop stuff, didn't really tie it around. <laughs> Controlled defecation is vital to social well-being, right? You can't have too many books in your library, that's Borges' problem. Um, the first form of self-control, which human beings learn, entails the ability to inhibit voluntarily, uh, voluntarily defecatory responses until circumstances are socially convenient. You don't throw the book that your grandma gave you out in front of her, right? That's, that's a book going out of your own sort of local social distribution. Um, the internal and external sphincters play an important role in maintaining continence over prolonged periods of time. I don't know if this is a really useful distinction, but the, maybe the internal sphincter is like, um, the university and then the external sphincter is like the larger world. I don't know if I want to make that distinction, but I think it could work. The appropriate performance of these functions requires exquisite coordination of a complicated series of interrelated events. For a book to be forgotten, for the record totally to be erased, um, it's kind of difficult, right? Especially in this sort of hyper-digital age. So that's sort of connected to the 
canonization question, but only very tangentially. That's all I have for now. I don't want to overspeak. <laughs>
Mm. Way to approach them. And then this is, I mean, this is first published in Eggers Mike magazine, mm. and is invited, as I as I understand it, to submit something. And this is what he submits. Mm. Um, so, any any questions from the? Uh, uh, so I loved both papers. Thank you, Thomas. Um, my, my question is for, for Jen, Jen. Do you go by Jen or Jen? Jen, 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 yeah. Jen um, uh, so the Eggers, so I, I'm not familiar with that whole backstory about the, the initial review that Eggers mm. wrote. It's really hard to find. Is that right? Yeah, I had to go <laughs> microfilm with the New York Public Library. <laughs> has he sub tried to suppress it? I don't know. It's, just, uh, yeah, it's not really a distribution. Um, so I just wonder, is that is that a problem? Well, is it a problem that mm. someone... So Change sometimes a work comes out that's so freaking bold mm. that initially people don't know how to ex how to take yeah. it, and then a few years later it's okay. So yeah. and another example of this is Night of the Living Dead in 1968 mm -hmm. when it came out. Roger Ebert shit all over that film. <laughs> so it was cruel, it's disgusting, nasty, mean. Mm. Uh, and then years later said I was wrong. Uh, and so. Uh, but is that part of just a sort of buzz too? Is that uh, is there a, a, a Night of the Living Dead effect that, yeah. that just sort of ends up then sort of retrospectively uh, influencing the critics? So I, I guess it's just it's a very big question. I know it, yeah. but you know, is it is is there something wrong with the fact that Eggers changed his mind? Uh, is it not just a sort of sign of the sort of boldness of a work? Yeah. Well, I think I, so there's two answers to the question. One is disingenuous, but like actually very uh, genuine. I am a chauvinist, <laughs> and I like to think that like whenever I read a work and I like it, that's like my final decision. I don't want to change my mind because I'm like too proud not to. So I look, I initially looked at the Eggers thing kind of skeptically, but to answer your question in a sort of logical sense, no, I don't think there's anything, absolutely nothing wrong with changing your mind. So if you go back and read it, you're like, wow, actually this is pretty good. Absolutely, you can do that. Not saying that I did it because I chose first the right time. Anyways, okay, moving on. <laughs> question about. Um, I'm thinking of, so in Alexander Pope's uh, revisions and, and editions of Shakespeare in the 17, 17 through 18, um, he made everything rhyme that wasn't rhyming, and he, he, he like made a poem of man, or what is it, a critique of man? What are the names, essay on man, and then that's his big poem, and then there's something else. But he, he edited Shakespeare's works in the style, he, you know, line edited things that were like too vulgar, or he would change words where he, he thought that another word would work, and that kind of thing. And it's very much less about Shakespeare and more about Pope, right? Mm -hmm. So the curation, in fact, says, says almost as much about the individual who's doing the curating than it does about the actual sort of content, right, that's being curated. And I think thinking about syllabus, I mean, the, the canon question is most tangible on the syllabus, because that's like the sort of document that it's like, that's like its primary sort of document of record, if you will. But I think, I think the syllabus, looking at syllabuses in a sort of bird's eye way would, over the course of 30, 40 years, would, would show more that, like sort of discrete pockets of, of literary influence. So like, like maybe Wallace was hated, uh, just like George Eliot was hated or something, right? at the start, and then there was like a little bit of a peak or something, maybe you could correlate that. I don't know if that in, in any way answers the question, but... Well, I just think it's a big question, yeah. and um, I really like to talk. Um, and then maybe it's also, because one of the questions you posed is, is it possible, how, how do we predict what's yeah. going to be in the canon and what's going to fall out? And maybe there, maybe you can't. I mean, it's, it's kind of weird um, because... You know, as as we develop and as we start to ask questions that we didn't used to ask, you know, as as Thomas's paper, you know, is rightly pointing to, then then other works might become more uh, important for the so-called canon than they once were, and so that might shave some off as well. And so, I don't know. I, I think it's a fascinating, a fascinating project. Has anybody read a book by Chuck Klosterman called um, "But What If We're Wrong"? It's Fucking brilliant! It's exactly. It's like Wallace. Ooh, you okay? It's like Wallace 2.0 because he has a, he has a footnotes and everything. It's similar topics, but he like doesn't he doesn't overdo it, which is like then it's tolerable. But he's actually it's a fascinating book. I mean, the question, but what if we're wrong? Has a lot of different angles. I assigned to my students a, a specific chapter called um, "Don't Tell Me." What is it? Don't take a picture. I'm recording. Oh, don't tell me about it. I'm recording. Um, and he has this thought experiment where he's like, if we are 5,000 years in the future and we're looking at like Mad Men or something, and we're like Game of Thrones, right? What is that? 
we're not right now in 2019. We're not watching Game of Thrones for like the sort of cultural content, like what you can sort of figure out about the lens or whatever. Like how can you tell something about the people from the lens? We're watching it to be entertained, right? Which is a very sort of Wallace and thing. But but classroom is like what if we what if we sort of scale that up and juxtapose it and. You're now an archaeologist looking 5,000 years back at an you know, Egyptian like television monitor or something, right? Um, and we, we wouldn't be watching for the entertainment. That might be sort of downstream concern from like the real interesting stuff for the archaeologist or whatever, is, which is actually like the sort of ways in which people have little movements or, or depending on your research angle, right? I don't know if that's at all useful, but I love that chapter and the book is really great for that because it, 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 he, it's a book long, I mean, it's maybe. 150, 200 pages, but that's, he's engaging with that, that idea of having, of like, literally having absolutely no idea where to go. And he, he has a great chapter on, I think it's, there's some Beatles single that was like almost obscure and then it like blew up or something. I read the whole book maybe a few years ago, but this one chapter is really good. Any other, any other questions? I just don't know where we are now I, to, to, to evaluate where he's going, how far he's going to go, you know? I, I hear a lot of new sincerity that's, uh, I don't know who that is or what authors are a part of that, but if that's the case, maybe he's a transitional figure. Maybe. Can you all still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We were asking about, you said you were asking about Klosterman specifically? About new no, no, I was about Wallace. I'm not sure oh, Wallace. In terms of, you know, how, yeah. what his place is and if, if he will or will not be canonized. Yeah. What does it take to be canonized? I just have more questions. I'll say this. Um. I think, I don't know about, we could do like an informal poll, but <laughs> we, I think we, should, we all came to Wallace sort of, I shouldn't generalize like that. Most people I know who enjoy and read David Foster Wallace came sort of independently of like a class or any kind of organized activity. They found it on a, some obscure online thing or they saw it in the bookstore or something, right? I think maybe that's how it, one becomes canon. And elsewhere in the paper, I suggest that, that Wallace's sort of unsureness is something I talked about at the end. Between the sort of contract novel and the, the status no he was not he wrote a status novel, but it didn't achieve status because it wasn't awarded, la la la, etc. Uh, but he also didn't really want to necessarily do a 100% contract novel. He wanted to do the communication half of what Franzen says the contract model does, but, but he also like doesn't speak in clear language sometimes and that's like totally antithetical to the contract while it's like totally a status kind of thing so he's he's insecure in that way too i don't know why i started rambling about that oh we were all coming to wallace right so like he himself is sort of in the middle of that and i think a lot of people come to him from the side right obliquely or or i don't know that's but that's that's i guess how you make the transition from the contract novel to the status novel right is you have enough people read it and you're like wow this is a masterpiece and then it sort of goes over right and that's if you don't get the literary awards or you know get on the list and that kind of thing it's like a diy version of your status novel but at some point you're from academia and at some point people start saying how that's not going on sorry what'd you say people so people are still saying what uh, um I assume in academia, at a certain point, that people are just ostracized, and authors are ostracized yeah. from syllabus. You know, it's just like, it's not part of our culture anymore. I think it's totally institution specific. I don't know, is anybody else teaching? And they have restrictions on what they can teach and what they can't? I have none. restrictions. <laughs> same, same. I'm a grad student, so I have a ton. <laughs> But, so, uh, I guess, uh, again, a, a big question that probably doesn't have a good answer. Are, like, okay, if, if I'm a, say, Baldwin scholar, I, I could get a job at a, at a university. Mm. Are, there, are there positions that are looking for Wallace scholars? Mm. I, would, I, I, I suspect not, but, uh, but I don't know. I think there's a lot of American Studies programs. I don't want to say a lot that are hiring, right? But I think the American Studies would be the most natural fit for someone like Wallace who does both the sort of not fiction and fiction. Okay. I don't know, what is it? I'm not on the job market, so it, Yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. a huge question. All right, I think we're just about out of time, so thanks again to uh, Tom and Jim. Keep me up all the time. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. So we didn't do this. Do you want to if I'm going to do it first since I want to see it? Yeah, no, carry on. I'm just going to do it. If I have a USB stick for PowerPoint, is that true? Oh, no, that should be fine. Should I do that in between or should I do that? Yeah. Uh, I'd say go ahead. Hey, do, what, when is your panel like? Yeah. Uh, no. Oh, the, um, what? Yeah, two of us my background's actually. Ben's going to go first, so then I'll go. Okay, let's go ahead and do that now. Yeah. Okay. Oh, here, let me. Oh, is that right? Yeah, but you might have to set up our own. So, how did you get your room? I read the class and I read the film first. Is that right? Yeah, that was exciting. Two seconds. So I did it for like three years, which is really good. Yeah. Marshall was so white that I could actually run it. No kidding. Yeah. But it was a fantastic experience. It was really fantastic. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then let me switch you to perhaps an adapter for that. Sorry, I have to the USB. Oh, I'm, I have USB C. So, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay, that, that, yeah, that's so, true. Right, it's just like intro. But okay. he said, I teach at Lincoln. We can use structure. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it at all, but there's a, it's a business set of campuses, almost like an Oxford style. There's a lot of different colleges. Yeah. Um, and okay. then there's like a central one. Graduate Center is like the Oxford Oh my gosh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I guess there it is. Oh, yeah. 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 So I was in philosophy for six years and uh, didn't get beautiful tenure track job at Gainsborough. So the college hired me to so the end of the um, which was actually one of the best things that could have happened to me. Because in philosophy, in switch, there's a curriculum, uh, there are history of philosophy classes, there's logic, there's ethics that you have to take. So we, the teachers, had to define those up. Yeah, I don't do nothing that I have to do. There's no interdisciplinary studies major, so there's no uh, curricular requirement connected to it. So I can teach what happened to so which is so cool. And yeah, it, it, I got so lucky. So I can create these courses um, so that I can fall Here you go. Oh, OK. Is it working? Yeah. OK. Starting to create a course called Biology and Maps in the Bodies of Women. Or, oh, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So, Sorry, I'm and it's it's it. just it's so because it's I'm going to be looking at yeah. politics and economics and cultural oh, Excellent. And, yeah. and cool. Thank you so much. All right, I will be. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah? Okay. Okay, and then let me start this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, oh, fantastic. So I'm thinking about that. And then do we have our, our operator? <laughs> okay, I'm going to show you how the... Why is that camera not charging again? Oh, it's charging. Okay. So the... Uh, 